Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for uh, this great passage in Exodus that um, in some ways we know, you might know so well, in other ways that we, we might be very happy with. And, uh, yeah, we, we, we pray now, we ask for your help by your spirit to not only understand these words um, and to, to know how they apply to us today, but also would you please by your spirit change us. Uh, would, would this be a night when we we fall more in line with who your son is and uh, how you would uh, have us live. Amen. Okay, well, uh, it was funny to me that the two songs we sung earlier both, both contained the, an image of the sun in some way, uh, because that was what I was, I was going to introduce tonight's talk with. The sun is our source of life in many ways, isn't it? In a physical sense. It's light, it's energy, it's heat, uh, providing the perfect conditions for life on this planet. Um, do you know several hundred thousand times every second the sun releases more energy than the entire human race uses in a year? That's a lot of energy. The sun's light allows plants to make food uh, and so provide us oxygen to breathe. And the vast gravity of the sun, which is 99.86% of the solar system's mass, by the way, um, is what keeps everything else in place. It's what keeps us drifting off into space. The sun is a hero of life to us in many ways. But the sun, obviously, is also incredibly dangerous to us. Uh, at its core, the sun is 15 million degrees Celsius. You can even begin to get close to the sun, obviously, with it. If you like, um, like a bit of tissue paper in a bonfire or something, you'd just be consumed. We all know, don't we, especially us who at least used to be gingers, uh, you know, just, just, just lying on a beach in the middle of the day in the summer, skin exposed, for a few hours even, you will get, uh, you, there's a danger to all of us. We know what that will do to us, and that's at a distance of 150 million miles away. The sun is a giver of life to us, but get close and it will bring you there. Um, it's the exact same characteristics, in fact, of the sun that cause both life and in tonight's passage, which we read a few minutes ago, we have a similar kind of situation with God's holiness. But how, how did we get here? So we might be through Exodus this term. Uh, back in Exodus 3, you might remember, Moses was tending to his sheep one day in the wilderness, and he came to the foot of this mountain, Mount Sinai, and it was there that the Lord first spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And he told Moses, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So 16 chapters later, that's what Moses does. That's where he goes. He leads the people back to Mount Sinai. And they assemble, they congregate on the plain before the mountain. And so as they're setting up camp, Moses uh, leaves them behind, he sets off up the rocky slopes to speak with God, to hear from God what he is going to have them do next, what's next. This is as far in the plan as Moses knows. And what God says to Moses on the mountain is beautiful. Read it again with you, verse 3, if you've got a Bible there. The Lord calls to Moses out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God wants to make this people his treasured possession. I hear that phrase and I just think of, immediately think of one of my girls and one of their teddies or something, cuddling up to it in their sleep, wanting to take it with them on every journey in the car, crying if their friend or their sister picks it up and runs off with it. Treasured possession. God's precious people. So what's God's plan for making his people into his treasured possession? Well, verse 5, as you see that word there, it's a covenant. It's his covenant. So a covenant in the ancient world is a bit like a contract. Uh, except it's more than a contract, it's a contract based on sort of relational promises. Best example in society today is, is a marriage. Uh, marriage is a covenant, it's a contract made with, with relational promises. 
Well, the covenant that God makes with his people at Sinai is based on, on the law that he gives them. So Mark makes it uh, as his own. He speaks the Ten Commandments from the mountain to his people, the stone tablets come later. And what follows that passage is that several chapters of, of law giving. And the law that God gives is good. It's liberating for these people. I think we often, we often hear words like law and commandments in the context of, of our culture of self-realisation and, and independence to an extreme. And we, and we hear it as something that kind of puts boundaries on our freedom. These are kind of stuffy, boring things. What we've got to remember is, is for these Israelites, where they've just come from. They've just walked out of slavery. They've just walked from a culture of oppression and injustice, where the, where the strong trample on the weak, where those in power do whatever they like. The pharaohs could literally make up and change laws just on a whim. They didn't need anyone to, to certify it. You know, they could wake up one day and just decide, we're going to throw all the Israelite baby boys in the river today. Here is the Lord. He's not capricious like Pharaoh. He doesn't make up laws on a whim. His law stands forever. And his law is good. It is full of faithfulness and justice. Where the weak are protected from murder and abuse. What's more, this law is missional. Uh, in chapter 19, verse 5, God says he's the God of all nations. So, verse 6, he wants to set apart Israel as a nation of priests. Now what do priests do? Well, they represent the people to God, and they represent God to the people. That's the role of priests. They're mediators. And Israel is to be a priestly nation to the world. They are to represent God missionally to the world around them. We see the same thing in the letter of 1 Peter, and Peter applies this very verse to God's people today. Our lives are to be so marked out that we represent God's name to the world around us. Here's a question. A question is often asked about this. How much of the Old Testament law is actually still binding for Christians today? Is it just the Ten Commandments? Uh, some of the other laws? What about some funny laws on clothing fabrics? Or what animals you can eat? Or you know, bathing goats and their mum's milk? Or whatever. Um, even the Ten Commandments. You know, what about the Sabbath day? That's the debate, isn't it? Does any of it apply? Well, it's a big question, and if we had longer to work through Exodus in all weeks, then yeah, we would have given a whole evening just to just the Ten Commandments, I'm sure, but we, we don't. So let me put it simply here, and you can feel free to ask me more questions afterwards. Here's my brief answer. In Christ, we have the New Covenant, which means that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law given to God's people at Sinai, that is no longer binding for us. That is God. Let me explain. The events of this passage tonight, the making of this covenant, happened 50 days after Passover. 50 days after the lambs were slain and the Israelites walked out of Egypt. They are given this law. And the Jewish calendar every year, the Israelites celebrated it 50, years, uh, 50 days sorry, after Passover, every year. At Pentecost, in, uh, in Greek that's literally 50th, 50th day. And, uh, and, and for Jews, it's traditional to this day to stay up late into the night, or all night, studying the books of the law at Pentecost. It's a, it's a festival about the law. And, uh, and 50 days after the death of Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb, that was when God made his new covenant with his people at Pentecost. When the room shook and the flames appeared over the disciples' head, not unlike what happened at Sinai the first time, uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's new covenant pe people. And, and Peter quoted the prophet Jeremiah. He said that today the Lord has now been written on our hearts. This is the law of Christ, as Paul calls it a couple of times in the New Testament. It's the law that Jesus himself taught when he summed up the leading behind the Old Testament law. So we to love God and love one another. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit now to apply teachings in the New Testament to us directly. So this is why the writer of the Hebrews calls the Old Covenant now obsolete. This is why Paul in Colossians 2 says, don't let anyone pass a judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regards to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Because the Old Covenant law is not binding on the Christian anymore. 
We are new covenant God's people. We are marked out by the Holy Spirit. Uh, anyway, for now, for the Israelites, the Mosaic law is what is to mark them out as God's people. God is giving his people life and freedom through his holy law. But just as the sun's heat and light and mass are the source of life for us on this planet, and the very same characteristics of the sun are also dangerous to us, in the same way, God's life-giving holiness was fatally dangerous for the Israelites. That's a big problem, the big issue in this passage, isn't it? Uh, throughout the whole thing. So Mount Sinai, this mountain, it represents a big gap. Uh, a great holiness gap. A gap between God, who is holy, and his people, who are not. And multiple times, here, God warns his people to mind the gap, in effect. Uh, verse 10, God tells Moses he's going to come down and speak to the people, but they must prepare themselves for it. Give them three days. Consecrate yourself, he says. Wash yourself. Get ready in moments. You know, stick on your Factor 50 Plus sun cream and bed, he says. But notice, that's, even that's not enough for them to approach God, is it? About as much as sun cream, I guess, allows you to go near the sun. Uh, verse 12. Limits have to be put around the base of this mountain, because if anyone touches the mountain, will die. And you get this funny conversation, it's funny to me anyway, to Moses and God from verses 21 to 25. Um, God tells Moses to tell them not to touch the mountain. And Moses says, yeah, you already told us not to touch the mountain, so we've put limits around it. And God says, good. Now tell them not to touch the mountain. This is a serious and persistent warning God has given them. Even then, even then, from afar, when God's presence comes down to the mountain, what's the people's response? Verse 16. Now there's thick smoke, thunder and lightning, the sound of trumpets, the mountain trembles, and so do the people. They are terrified at seeing the presence of God, at hearing his voice. And a question God asks you through this passage tonight is this. How seriously do you take God's holiness? Does church sometimes just seem like a bit of fun and games to you? Because it's the same God, isn't it? God hasn't changed since this mountain. It's the same God we come to worship tonight. In Deuteronomy, Moses refers back to this event as the first ever assembly of God's people. It's the first congregation. It's the first worship service. It's the prototype for what we do in church today. And they trembled in fear and even a glimpse of God's holiness. Because they knew that they themselves were not holy. When I said to you earlier that the Lord isn't binding for us, I didn't mean we can just rip it out of our Bibles and act like it's not there. It's still useful to read it today. For one thing, as we read today, it teaches us, just as the Lord taught the Israelites, that we are not holy, that we are in need of a Saviour. The fact of the matter is, if you look down at the Ten Commandments given by God, the fact of the matter is, the Israelites have broken every single one. And so have I. And so have you. Now, you might literally have never murdered or robbed anyone, but Jesus himself, didn't he, in his teaching, he made it quite clear that these, these laws are just, they're just indicators of what's really going on in our hearts all the time. The, the depth of brokenness and evil that is inside every one of us. Let me show you, let's work through them. You can, you can follow this along from 20 verse 3 if you like. Number one, you have loved yourself or something else more than God. Number two, you have made God into a graven image. You, you've reimagined him or you've shrunk him down in your heart. Number three, you have misrepresented God's name or his life. Number four, you have failed to trust and rest in God, resting instead in your own work or strength. Number five, you have resisted the authority of your parents or of others. Number six, you have hated others, seeking their fall or demise in some way. Number six, seven, you have lusted faithlessly after others. Number eight, you have acted and thought greedily and selfishly. 
Number nine, we have lied or gossip or said untrue things about others. Number ten, you have harboured bitter and jealous thoughts and not lived in contentment and gratitude. You and me, every single one of us here tonight, we have failed God's standard on not just one or two of these, but on every single count. If you secretly think you're not that bad a person here tonight, and, and let's be honest, we all have way too high a view of our own righteousness, don't we? Then hear this. You have not a single leg to stand on before God. And that's a problem. That should leave us trembling at the foot of the mountain of God. Trembling in fear at the thunder and the lightning and the fire and the smoke of his holiness and righteousness. This is the issue. God wants to call a people to be his holy, precious, treasured possession. But, but they can't even get near. Uh, Martin Luther is a famous reformer from 500 years ago. In his early life as a monk, he understood his failure and sin. So it was normal for monks to go to confession every day in the monastery. Um, it wouldn't take long. Just pick something. You know, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Uh, last night at supper, Brother Andrew's bowl of parsnip stew looked bigger than mine, and I covered it. Well, a penance instructed, uh, pardon given, off he toggled back to your heart. Go back to it. But not Martin Luther. No, he used to stay up sometimes all night long reading his Bible for hours, studying the teachings of Jesus, studying the law, um, the Old Testament law. And he was driven to distraction with terrified fear. God terrified him. And so he would confess every day for hours, trying to make sure he didn't miss a single thing that he could remember that he'd done wrong. And he drove the head monk in his monastery insane with annoyance. Just keep me alone, Martin. Um, go find someone else to confess to you. Now later he would grasp the work of Christ and God's grace for him properly. But in all of his confessions, I think Martin Luther was probably the only man in all of Christendom to properly understand and take seriously Catholic theology and practice. Our sin is serious. God's holiness is a problem for us. God is like the sun in some ways. His, his presence is the source of our life. Uh, but because of our sin, his presence is also fatally dangerous for us. So what did God's people need? Well, they needed a mediator, didn't they? They needed Moses. Uh, Moses' mountain climbing expeditions are what stood out to me actually most this week when I was studying this passage. I ended up needing to draw a little pictures of mountains and our up and down arrows and margins as we went down to keep track of Moses uh, all the time. Um, throughout this passage in the following chapters, Moses goes up and down the mountain a total of seven times. Seven. Remember this mountain is thousands of feet high probably, I guess. Uh, it's in North Africa. This guy's in his 80s. Uh, my favourite one is chapter 19 verse, verse 20. Look at that. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So off he goes. I can imagine him kind of standing at the top, hands on his knees, chest heaving, um, kind of just dragged himself up to the top for the third time in three days. And verse 21, the Lord says to Moses, go down and warn the people. And Moses says, hold on, go down. Is that what you called me up here to tell me? I've just got here. Can you send a dove with a note or something? Go down. Not even a high Moses. How are you? Good effort making all the way up here. I'm sure I'll be trying to trouble you. That's a long way, you know. Uh, no, obviously not. He's far more gracious than that. He understands everything that God's holy is to be talking about. But, but here's the point. Moses has to meet God halfway. Uh, to hear God's word, to relay it to the people trembling people down at the bottom, he has to meet God at the peak of the mountain, halfway into heaven and earth. That's, that's the image here. Halfway. So Moses is fit to be the mediator, isn't he? He's fit for the role. Literally, he's fit because he has to climb mountains at the time. But we also have a mediator, don't we? We have a mediator who is perfectly fit for his role. Uh, Jesus Christ is the ultimate 
mediator. He also closes, he, he ascends to God as our representative. He can do that, he can be our representative because he is fully human. He was born of a woman, Mary, in a childhood. He had to grow and learn, he had to sit under the authority of his parents and his teachers. He had to face suffering and temptation so that he fully knows and understands what it's like to be one of us because he is one of us. And he, like Moses, ascended on our behalf. But unlike Moses, who ascended into the thick clouds and reached up the mountain and, and had to stop, Jesus' disciples watched as, as he rose into the sky and he broke through the clouds. And so now Jesus Christ, a human, stands before our Father God on our behalf. He represents us before the Lord, taking us into his presence. Now keep your finger in Exodus, if you've got a Bible there, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I want us to read this part together. And I want to, I want to, I want to let it change our perspective on, on what we're doing tonight as we gather for worship. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. It says this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire of darkness and gloom and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is, this is what the writer of the Hebrews says about our passage tonight. In Christ, we too are gathered in a great assembly. But it's not at the foot of Mount Sinai. It's at the foot of the throne of the living God. And we worship not just here in the flesh, but in Christ we simultaneously are worshipping in heaven. With Moses and with the twelve apostles and with Christian saints from every past generation and surrounded by angels. There are angels who are shoulder to shoulder with us here tonight if we can have the faith to see it. As we sing and as we pray, as we hear God's voice speaking to us in his words, all of this happens because Christ is taking us there by the Holy Spirit. We ascend with him, our ultimate mediator. It's not just a picture. It's the, it's the, it's the mind-blowing spiritual reality of what is going on as we, as we gather, when we assemble as God's people. You can't really create that at home, can you? Watching church on, on your TV set. Um, but you are here, so you just require a moment. Um, but there's more, though, because Christ is not only Moses going up Mount Sinai, not just Moses going up, he is also the Lord coming down the mountain, isn't he? Jesus Christ is the one who perfectly ascended up the mountain and through the clouds beyond the peak, and Jesus Christ is also the one who perfectly descended down the mountain, beyond the foot, onto the plain where his people are. Because Christ is the Lord, he is the great I am. Yahweh himself, Christ is fully God, God in flesh. He was born not just of woman, but also of the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God, God's Son. God hasn't looked at that humanity in our sin, and our brokenness, and our trembling, and just barked orders at us like an angry personal trainer. He has done the work. He has come down the mountain, so to speak, not so that people would tremble in fear, but so that we might be comforted from our suffering, so that we might be cleansed from our sin and, and forgiven our failure and brokenness. In Christ, God has come to us in person. The voice of God was terrifying for the Israelites, but if you want to hear God's voice now, then you have it. John 1, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ. We have God's Word. 
Jesus held out to us, to nourish us, to feed us, to lead us, and guide us, and bring us life. Just like with our corporate worship, do not underestimate the seriousness of the spiritual reality that occurs when the word is read and heard and preached. Christ is the one who is fit to mediate God's word to us. Because he's fully human, he's the one that can go up the mountain on our behalf and into heaven. And because he is fully God, he's the one, uh, he's the word of God, come down the mountain to us, into the wilderness where we are. And the word of God, in this instance in Mosaic law, the word of God not only teaches us our of Christ, but it teaches us what our Christ is like. You can go through the Ten Commandments as we did and ask them of ourselves, but you can also go through them and ask them of Christ. And just like everything in the Old Testament, Christ perfectly fulfills every single one. Now, he perfectly represents God. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He loved his Father perfectly. He loved others perfectly. Ultimately, he laid down his life for us in love. The law shows us Christ. If you start Hebrews 12 open, uh, keep a finger in it, because we'll, we'll go back to it till we end, but click back to Exodus 20 again for a minute. I just want to read these verses again. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. God spoke to them, and they still trembled, but then Moses says something weird. Um, Moses says, basically, do not fear, for God wants you to fear. And all the people said, huh? But I think what Moses is, is basically saying is, don't worry, you're doing the right thing. Your response is right. Don't worry about being afraid. Israel, don't fear your fear, in other words. Because it is right to fear God. It's right to, to take God's holy voice with, his death, with this deathly level of seriousness that you are. We all fear the voice and commands and opinions of someone. Whether it's God, whether it's our friends, or our boss, or our parents, or a boyfriend, or girlfriend, or, or just the, the community in general. What about you? Whose voice do you fear? Whose word matters most to you? You can only answer that question by thinking about how you react when people express pleasure or disappointment in you. Whose voice affects you? the most? Is it the voice of the Lord? Are you most invigorated by his pleasure? Are you most joyful from his declarations of love? Are you most bothered by his disappointments? Are you most driven to change by his discipline? Or is it about others? As we finish, look at the rest of Hebrews 12 with me. Uh, verses 25 to 29. Hopefully you still got a finger in there. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. How are we to gather um, how are we to approach God when we gather in worship? We have to come with a healthy and serious fear of God. 
When you come in reverent awe, do you see those two words in verse 28? Reverence and awe. Not just because this is just something we do, isn't it, on a Sunday? Or because the food is nice, or because our friends are here, or because we're bored, or we've got nothing else to do. The God who shakes mountains with lightning and thunder and smoke and fire, he is speaking. He is speaking to us in Christ. And so we fear God with reverence all. But we also come with, with confident gratitude, don't we, verse 28. And let's be grateful. Because in Christ we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God, this new world order, it, it, it's not just like a, a poxy several thousand foot high rocks, rock solid mountain that can be shaken. This kingdom of God is forever. We needn't be afraid of the voice of anyone else. We didn't fear anyone else. We come to the Lord, the great I am, to worship him, to hear his voice. Rock solid in Christ is what we are. More than rock solid in Christ. Let's pray to him. Father, we, we come with gratitude because we are your treasured possession in Christ. We are your special, precious, holy, chosen people, treasured possession. We are brought to you by, by the Son, our mediator. We have, we have your law written on our hearts by your Spirit. The work we have done in us is amazing. We have done nothing. We just set up tents at the foot of the mountain. We've done nothing. We just, we just come and we gather and we, we camp and you have done everything. The up and down the mountain is all you. And so tonight, Father, now we, we're going to sing, we worship you tonight, Father, in reverence and awe, with confident gratitude in what you have done for us. Thank you, Father. You're in all of your holiness. Thank you for what you have done. Okay, we're going to stand, we're going to sing, we're going to sing with the angels. Let's do that together.